it's back up, up. It was just bobbing and weaving up front. Actually, have a shield. You're gonna be throwing tomatoes at you, Bob. It's gonna be rough. Well, it's been a bit. Well, beer bottles. Check one thing, but I beer bottles will be It's gonna be looking. I live a few country western. Yeah, I was gonna say that's where that happens. <laughs> Good morning, ZPC. Good morning. It is great to see you on this brisk but calm morning. It's nice not to have to be tethered to your spouse to walk around outdoors today. So in all seriousness, it's good to see everybody here and safe. We welcome you on this Palm Sunday. We especially want to welcome those of you who are at home joining us on the live stream. We welcome you as well. And I want to give a special thanks and welcome to those of you who are joining us perhaps for the first time if you would stop on your way out at the welcome center which is just on your right as you leave we have some type of goodie for you i'm not sure what that is i meant to check that this morning on the way in but um, somebody go pressure test that promise for me we should have some good zpc swag or something so we want to welcome you we have just a couple of announcements here this morning the first one is we have nominations for the nominating committee are now open. Now, I, I realize, and I've been in your seat while well, I am weekly, and oftentimes I'm cynical, and this sounds like a committee for committees. It's, it sounds a little bit redundant, but in all seriousness, this is an important position. These are the individuals who will be going out to curate the slate of individuals who will be our next set of deacons and elders. Okay, so these individuals are in charge of finding those people. Those names will then, then be presented to all of us during a congregational meeting for a vote. This is a great way to get plugged in. It's a great way to meet a lot of people because you'll be talking to a lot of folks on the phone for interviews and working with this committee. So you can sign in on, or you can nominate online or stop by the Welcome Center. Very easy, if you go on your phone right now, it's about the third tile down. Just scroll down and you can submit a name for nomination. And then secondly, as we all know, we are entering Holy Week. We are gonna have a Good Friday service, obviously on Friday. Uh, an Easter Eve brunch. I read this a little bit too quickly. This is Easter Eve brunch. So as it says, it's in the morning. I was just stopped and asked what time the Easter egg hunt was going to be. I don't have that information. You're gonna, I'd, I'd love to point to Come back at 1030 and I'll have that answer for you. Okay. Easter Eve brunch on the morning of uh, Easter Eve and then Easter Sunday services at our normal time. I would share one quick reflection with you. You know, I think it's easy and I remember this when I taught down in the um, with the little kids. I think it's very easy for us oftentimes to jump from the hosannas and the triumphal entry on one Sunday right across the week into next Sunday and the he is risen and the excitement and the greetings of that morning. I think it's really critical to slow down our week on Friday whether you can join us or not for the service. Friday afternoon, just take a moment. I try and do this with my family. Just take a moment to think about the sacrifice that was made on Friday for all of us while we were still sinners, before we were even formed in our mother's womb, I would tell you it makes the excitement and the enthusiasm and the celebration on Sunday that much more special. So just take a moment this week to reflect on that as, as Friday hits your calendar, your calendar. With that, let's continue our worship. Well said, Jim. Thank you. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we're going we're gonna to sing some songs together and you get to freely posture yourselves this morning, whether sitting or standing, but 
you must sing with us.
is plentiful where your streams of abundance flow blessed be your name you deserve the glory Jesus blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place though I walk through the wilderness blessed be your name every blessing he pours we pour out we turn back to praise every blessing Pour out, I'll turn back to praise. Please let it be. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. That's what Jim said. I really appreciated that, Jim. I don't know if you're still in this room, but Sunday is coming, and we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but he resurrected 2,000 years ago. We stand on that this morning. He's worthy of our praise because he is king. He's worthy of our praise because he made us. And so we're going to keep praising him. That's all right with you all. Today is not a day of sorrow. We could save that for Friday. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the
return to you. For us, and so we immerse ourselves in that story. I mean, it probably looked a little different 2,000 years ago, but but there probably would have been some tentativeness to what's going on. But being a part of his story is not just remembering. I think it's immersing ourselves in it. It's thinking about it. It's but it's also acting it out in a way that we can participate in it. So we're going to sing this new song this morning. And it's really easy, and maybe you've heard it, but probably not. And so I don't want you to fret that you can't sing along, because by the time we get to the end of the song, many of you would be able to sing this. It's kind of redundant, but it tells a story. But this is how the chorus goes. Friday's good, because Sunday's coming. 
Don't lose hope, cause Sunday is coming Devil, you're done, you better start running Friday's good, cause Sunday is coming Pretty easy, right? Maybe a little odd, but you'll get it I have faith in you all Great light dawns in Galilee Some say madman, some say king Wonder-working rebel priest Jesus Christ the Nazarene He knew well what it would take Free us all from sin and grave A perfect man would have to die And only he could pay that price Friday's good cause Sunday's coming Don't lose hope cause Sunday's coming Devil, you're done, you better start running Friday's good, cause Sunday's coming So we let those soldiers take him in And his friend betrayed him with a kiss There before the mocking cry like a lamb to the slaughter didn't make a sound Then he carried that cross to Calvary And he shed his blood to set us free As the nails went in and the sky went dark The redemption of the world bowed his head the son of God and man was dead with bloody hands tears on their face they laid him down inside that grave but that wasn't the end that wasn't the end that wasn't the end
Like a bride for a groom, oh church arise, he's coming soon. With that thought, let us sit together in silence. Let us pray. Most loving God, as we enter this holy week, we think of you in so many ways. God, today, as people shouted back then, we can say, Hosanna in the highest, and we can sing songs of praise to you as we have been doing. And God, as we move forward in this week, we remember how you showed the full extent of your love to your friends as you washed their feet and you shared a meal with them. We are humbled by how you prayed before your arrest and how you gave your life on the cross. We realize that your life was not only for the sins of the people then, but our own sin even now. And so God, with humility, we thank you for your sacrifice. And God, we give praise looking forward to one week from today, knowing that you defeated death And because of your love and your life, we too can have life, abundant life with peace and joy and meaning and purpose. And together we can look forward to eternal life with you. God, in the meantime, help us to to live this abundant life now. As we experience this springtime, we pray for those who have a break from school or work and traveling mercies for them. We pray for how you have been working in the church this winter and spring through ministry to children and next gen, to adults through ministries like Great Banquets and through home groups, and God, even for the wonderful congregational meeting last week. And we give you thanks and praise, and we ask your help for our future at this church. We thank you for the chance to serve you, whether it is here close to home or in places like Romania or Egypt. We give you thanks for the work of faithful Christians in those other places around the world who inspire us with their courage and their faith. And we give you thanks for the good trips and safe return of ZBCers to those places. God, we also humbly bring our request and we pray for those in need, especially those families who were the victims of the shooting in Nashville earlier this week and others in our nation who are victims of violence. We pray for those who are dealing with devastation and loss from Friday nights, tornadoes, and storms here in Indiana and in other states in our nation. God, we we ask that you provide for the needs of your people, O Lord. And we lift up our prayers to you, God, for for our own church family as well. And God, we pray for healing for those who need healing. For our good friends, Pamela Ackerman, and Rachel True Love, for Rosemary Pratt, Carol Milley, and others. We give you thanks for the birth of a new son, Bo Christopher, and his parents, Zach and Amy Barrett. God bless each of them, please. And God, we thank you for the gift of prayer. And so we pray now as Jesus taught, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, welcome again. We want to thank you, uh, before we hand it off to Pastor Jerry, for your generosity. Uh, Your generosity helps fund the mission of the church and the missions of the church in places like 
Romania and Egypt, where I just got back from. I'll tell you more stories later. But your dollars go to do incredible things both here locally and around the world. So we're so thankful for your incredible generosity. I wanted to remind you, you can give in a number of ways. They're on the screens here or at the boxes in the back of the room. Thank you again. Well, thank you, Pastor Scott. It is good to have you back after your trip to Egypt. And uh, we do look forward to hearing about that. And happy Palm Sunday, ZPC. Jeez. You know, here's what happens. So many people go off on spring break that even those who come here, all you're doing is thinking about spring break right now, right? So, well, it's good to have you here. Um, like I said, I know that there are many who are out and about, but it is great to have you here. It's always good to have our, uh, uh, the reminder of our covenant children um, and the gift that they are to this particular body. And so um, I am glad to have uh, to be able to be here this morning. We are uh, not looking at Luke today. Last week we took away from Luke and we're not going to look at Luke today or next uh, Sunday. I decided that we wouldn't look at the Luke in um, Easter story. We will instead are looking at the Gospel of Mark and how he tells the story of Palm Sunday and then next week Easter. And so this morning I'm going to be reading from Mark chapter 11 verses 1 through 11. So I invite you to hear these words. When they, and that's Jesus and the disciples, were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village ahead of you. And immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden, untie it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it. And we'll send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. And as they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Sisters and brothers in Christ, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, we do pray that you would be with us this morning as we ponder this story that is known well by most of us. We pray that you would continue to illuminate our hearts, our minds, and our souls. And I pray, Lord, that the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen and amen. So this week I was reminded of kind of the challenge that occurs whenever you give a title to something. It's true in lots of things, but it's of course also very true when it comes to stories in Scripture. So one of the classic examples, of course, is what we will see in Luke chapter 15 when we get there, which is you know, the story of the prodigal son. That's usually how we title it, and that means that that's what we look for. That's mostly who we focus on is the prodigal son. But when you do so, you omit kind of the importance oftentimes of the father and even the older brother and what they might teach us as well. And this week we come into the problem again because typically we call this, as I just said, what's today? Palm Sunday. But of course, if you were only reading Mark, you would have no idea that it was Palm Sunday. I mean, he says something about branches, but we don't know for sure what kind of branches they are. And then, of course, he talks about the fact that they are throwing cloaks. So we could also call this Cloak Sunday. It doesn't quite have the ring to it, right? But you could call it Cloak Sunday, right? But we don't really think about that. We focus instead on palms. Or another name that this is oftentimes given is the triumphal entry. And so we tend to then just focus on the fact of Jesus marching into Jerusalem. And we don't see all that much 
else. Now, there's nothing wrong, of course, with focusing on palms, and there's nothing wrong with focusing on Jesus marching into Jerusalem. What happens, though, is that at times we then are kind of blinded to everything else that is going on. And so this week, as I was kind of pondering this passage, I was asking myself, well, what else is going on that maybe we don't always look at quite as much? Uh, One of the things, of course, that we begin to see is the context of this particular passage. This is happening right before Passover, and it's happening as many are on a pilgrimage into Jerusalem. Thousands, some would suggest hundreds of thousands of people who every year would go into the pilgrimage. And all of a sudden, Jerusalem would begin to grow in size. And for many people, in fact, they only did this once in their lifetime. They only went into Jerusalem once. And so there's all this sense of of expectancy and excitement as they begin to go into Jerusalem. Jerusalem. I was thinking about pilgrimage of late, uh, partly because when I was in uh, Germany this past summer and uh, was in Freiburg, I took several hikes, and many of them uh, were on a path that's known as Jakob's Weg, which just means the way of St. James. And it's a route, perhaps many of you have heard of this, the more famous one is when you do the Camino de Santiago, or it's just called the Camino, and it's this pathway that you go and takes you into the city in Spain uh, and into a church where traditionally uh, it is understood that the uh, bones of the Apostle James uh, lie and state there at this particular church. And we as Protestants, we're not, we don't tend to be really big into pilgrimages. Uh, over the last few decades, there have been more of us uh, who have done that, but the Roman Catholics are, are much larger into this. And one of the fascinating things about a pilgrimage is that what happens is that you put yourself in a very different physical space. And when you do that, it allows you to be in a different emotional space and even spiritual space. So you begin to be open to different things. You you are disrupting your life, so to speak. And I think that that's actually really important. One of the ways that we sometimes say this around here is we call these these speed bumps in our lives. What is so easy to do is get in a particular rhythm of our lives. And we like rhythm. We like structure. And it can be good. We like to know what to expect. This is what we do in our lives. We have breakfast. We go to work. We have lunch. We have dinner. We put the kids to bed. Or we go to bed after watching a TV show. When spring comes, we go on. Spring break, this is what we do, right? And then we go back to work, and then when summer comes, we take a trip, perhaps, and this is what happens. And that's all good and right, but what also begins to occur if we are not paying attention is we get into a stupor of sorts. We're not really paying attention to what's happening, and so we begin then to pay less attention to what's going on with the Lord in our midst. And so it is really wise in many ways to begin to intentionally put things in our lives. Sabbath should be one of those things. I've been reading a lot of books on pilgrimages. One of those is uh, called The Unlikely Pilgrimage of Harold Fry. It's a fictional take, and and you have this older gentleman who's caught up again in this malaise of of his marriage, and the malaise of of grief over his son, and the malaise of older age, and he hears about a co-worker, an ex-co-worker who lives several hundred miles away, and so he decides he wants to uh, mail her a letter because he's never actually just told her uh, thank you for something she had done, and so he walks out to the mailbox, and he's going to put it in, and then he just keeps walking. And he walks literally hundreds of miles so that he can hand deliver this note. And of course, as he's walking, he's having conversations and he's noticing that he's listening to people and he's listening to things and he's seeing things that he has never seen before because he decides to just keep walking. Now, I would not encourage you to go on a pilgrimage without telling your spouse as he did. But I do think that there is wisdom in intentionally putting yourself in these different situations in which you are then more aware of where God is at work. It doesn't always have to be pilgrimages. Uh, My wife and I are doing something this year where we are, uh, every month, we are fasting something. Now, these aren't big things that we're fasting. It doesn't need to be. But we fasted a couple months ago podcast, right, which may not be a big deal to you, but 
Man, it made running a lot more difficult. It made being in the car a lot more difficult, right? So we fasted that. I fasted having emails on my phone. It's just these small kinds of things. But what occurs, especially if it's something you regularly do, is that at just the time when you do that, you remember, no, no. And it, it, it changes the stupor of one's life enough to begin to pay attention. And so what you have here at this particular day is you have all of these pilgrims who have begun to make their way into Jerusalem and they are living lives of expectancy. They are expecting both to celebrate what God did thousands of years earlier and they are expected to see what is God up to now. And so this is the situation. This is the context. And in the very middle of that, of course, we have our story today. One of the interesting things to observe about how it is that we might be more open to where God is at work is seeing exactly how Mark tells this particular story. I don't know if you noticed it, but it's a strange telling. Mark spends an inordinate amount of time talking about this dumb donkey. It reminded me a little bit, maybe you have people like this in your lives, maybe you know someone who who tells stories but gets really caught up in the details that don't seem to actually matter. Do you ever have that? It's like, oh, okay, oh, I gotta tell you, this is so good. Okay, so it it was Monday. No. No, wait, it was Tuesday. No. I'm sorry, it was it was Wednesday. I had dry cleaning that I was taking in. It must have been Monday. Oh, yes, it was Monday. And then they continued to say, okay, and there I was. I was at 116th in Michigan. No. No, wait, it was, where is that Kroger? 106th in Michigan. It was 106th in Michigan, and they... 96. It was 96 in Michigan. And you get to the point where you're like, <laughs> just tell the story. Do any of you have people like that in your life? Maybe not. Maybe it's just me. And you just just get to the, what's the main point? Is this the main point? And this is what Mark does. You know, as we read the story, you think, you know what most important, of course, it's the whole, you know, palms or branches and cloaks. I mean, this is the exciting part. But when you listen to Mark, what's he do? He's like, okay, you know, here's what I want you to do. He decides to tell all of them. As you enter into it, you will find there a colt that has never been written. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this. The Lord needs it. We'll send it back here immediately. They went away. Now he could have just said, this is exactly what the disciples did, but he does it. He goes, oh, they went away and they found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. And as they were untying it, some of the bystanders did say to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said and they allowed them to take it. So they brought the colt to Jesus. All of these details, right? When you want to say, no, Mark, just get to the main point. Why spend literally, count it, more verses talking about this dadgum donkey than marching into Jerusalem? As Scott Hosey says, it's a little bit like reading a recipe. It's not that exciting. What do you want with the recipe? You want the finished product, right? Let's go right there. But no, that is not what Mark does. He spends all of this time talking about these needless details about a donkey. Now, there are some who would suggest, well, this is because Mark wants us to see what a miracle it is, but there's no sign that it actually is a miracle. It could be a miracle, but it also could be that Jesus had already prearranged these things. Some would say, well, yeah, but what he's wanting to do is show us how it connects with the Old Testament, perhaps, and yet there's no explicit, other gospel writers make it more explicit, there's no explicit connection with this actual, with the actual Old Testament rendering. It seems quite odd. But then, but then we are reminded of what we've talked about a lot in the Gospel of Luke, which is how Jesus is so often actually caught up, not in the spectacular, not in the highly special, not in the extraordinary, but in the incredibly small details of our lives. And if you are preparing the way of the Lord and you are waiting to see Jesus only in those extraordinary moments, then you will miss him again and again and again. This is exactly what Tom Long says. Tom Long says, you know what? Here's the truth. A lot of times in our journey, we are simply donkey fetchers. 
It's just what we do. We go out and we are fetching donkeys. It's not all that exciting always. You know what? There are times when what you're doing is you're just in the nursery with a baby or two at the church and this is what it looks like for you to experience and be a part of what Jesus is doing. Sometimes it's just making brownies and taking it over to a neighbor who is new or who you know is struggling. Sometimes it's just spending uh, all night at a hospital in a waiting room with someone whose husband is having surgery. Sometimes it's just being on a church committee where for the first half of the meeting, you talk about what you did at the last meeting, and the second half of the meeting, you talk about what you should discuss at the next meeting. Sometimes it is just simply being about these small details of life that may not seem all of that interesting or exciting, and yet Jesus is found right there. One of the things that we'll see here in just a couple of weeks um, actually three weeks on the 23rd of this month is we're going to have in the gym this thing called um, Super, Super Servant Sunday. And it's going to be full of opportunities for us to be able to hear more about what are those small things that we can be a part of that are a part of what God is doing. Sometimes it's writing a note uh, to a mission worker. Sometimes it may be doing something where you end up just taking out the trash. Sometimes it may be something like tutoring a child. It can be lots of different things. But here Here is the truth that all of those things, if we have the eyes to see, are a part of this larger mission of God. One of the things that Long goes on to say is it says, all of these small things are gathered into the great ark of Jesus' redemptive work in the world. Think about this. Think about if you're one of these disciples. We don't know which disciples they are. Uh, Many think that it's actually James or John because in the chapter before, you may remember this, James and John ask Jesus if they can please sit at his right and his left. Now, if you're Jesus and you know you have two people who are dealing with hubris, what do you ask them to go do? Go get a donkey. Now imagine this, you're three years in. Three years ago, you are an early adopter. You're like, I am following Jesus. This is gonna be incredible. He's gonna be the Messiah. Everything is gonna change. You are three years in and you have reached now the level of donkey fetcher. What would you think? How excited would you be? Would you really think, man, I am doing something for the kingdom of God. This is incredible. (laughs) My children are going to be so mortified that I just did that. (laughs) I mean, this is the apex. And yet, here is also the truth which is that in just a few hours, because of the fact that they got this donkey, Jesus is gonna be on top of it, and there are going to be people who are waving palms and who are shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. And within a week's time, right, they have been a part of this remarkable occasion where Jesus Christ himself will be resurrected from the dead and the whole world will have turned on its axis. But in that very moment, think about it from their perspective it looked like they were doing little else but trying to get manure out from in between their toes but when we are preparing the way of the lord and we are engaging in these small acts we have no idea of the way in which the lord is using all of these small things within the greater arc of what god is doing Now, the second observation I want us to kind of consider, and I will admit, it may be stretching it a bit, but just bear with me. The second thing I want us to consider when it comes to how can we get into a position where we are really more aware of the presence of God, preparing the way of the Lord, is to just pay attention to the fact that when they went in and they got this donkey, they took him, and what did they say? They said, hey, we are going to return him. In other words, what did Jesus do? Jesus was borrowing the donkey. But what's fascinating to see about the life of Jesus is just how many things he was borrowing. I love what someone said. It's right here. It says this, Jesus was born in a borrowed place 
and laid in a borrowed manger. As he traveled, he had no place of his own to spend the night. He rode into the city on a borrowed donkey. He ate his final meal in a borrowed room. He was crucified on a borrowed cross, and when he died, somebody placed his body in a borrowed tomb. Jesus again and again was not owning, was owning a remarkably small amount, but instead was just borrowing things here and here and here. And you may say to yourself, well, that's not really that big of a deal. Surely there's no point with this, except for the fact that, as we'll see here in just a few weeks, when we get uh, later on to Luke chapter 9, and he's talking to his disciples, and he's telling them to do this. Here's what he says, take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, not even an extra tunic. Whatever house you enter, stay there and leave from there. There was a whole sense of the importance of traveling lightly. And of course, you all know this passage after passage where Jesus talks about the dangers of wealth and just the the grace and the gratitude and the joy of not having so much stuff. There's this remarkable thing about simply traveling lightly that Jesus seemed to understand. Now, I, I realize it was a very different time and place. Yet I have been wondering this week, what happens when we begin to live more freely? I love what one monk says. He says, if your closet is empty, there is more room for God. If your closet is empty, there is more room for God. Now, I am not suggesting that all of us have empty closets. But I am suggesting, I wonder how much we reflect and think about those things that we put in our closets or in our garages or in our property or whatever else it may be. What's fascinating is to think about how much easier, how much more freedom we might have if we had less stuff. John Mark Comer makes this point. He says, it's kind of interesting, you know, a lot of times, you know, you, you, you work, you think we would work so that we could have money so that then we could have more time, more freedom, more flexibility. This is what we really want. But what happens is, spend our time, we, we, we make money, and then we buy stuff. And because of the fact that we buy all this stuff, then we have to work more, which takes more time, right? And so that we can have more stuff. And so then you end up actually having less freedom than what you were supposed to have because we just keep getting more things. Alan Fadling, he was here a couple years ago as one of our speakers. He says, the drive to possess is an engine for hurry. It's interesting. I, when we, we talk a lot here about trying to slow down, and I'm not sure how often we think about this, but it feels to me like it dovetails. <clears throat> You know, sometimes when we talk about, oh, I just need to slow down, I'm just doing, oh, I'm just doing all these things, you know, and it's just so busy, and, and we think, well, we just need to, you know, uh, we, we, we need to stop doing so much, we need to get fewer things on our calendar, and perhaps that's right, but I wonder how many times when we are at the cash register, do we ever go to a cash register, how many times before you click something, <laughs> do you ask yourself, By clicking on this, am I actually going to make myself busier because I need to have more money in order to buy this thing, which means I need to spend more time doing this thing to get the money to buy this thing. How often do we consider the fact that the less we have, it might also mean the more space and freedom and time that we have. The more time we might have to be present to God. The more time that we might have to be present to one another. The more time we might have to simply be able to be still because we don't have the burden of wondering, oh, I've got this debt or I've got to pay this thing or whatever else it may be. What would it look like to begin to consider before we start purchasing? What exactly are we buying? And what exactly is this actually costing us? There's one last observation that I want to make about this story and about how it helps us to experience the presence of God. I want us to just simply consider the significance of the fact that Jesus went on this journey and into Jerusalem and the significance of the fact that he did this for 
you. John Buchanan makes this great point that Jesus could easily have just stayed in the more serene area of the Sea of Galilee. When we were there last year on that trip to Israel, Scott's going to take another trip next year if you're interested in going. And it is amazing how serene, yes, there are storms from time to time in the Sea of Galilee, we know that. But compared to Jerusalem, it is remarkably peaceful. And Jesus could have easily decided to just simply stay there. It would have been much more secure, much more comfortable than going into Jerusalem. Jesus could have remained safe by going town to town as a rabbi, but instead he chose to be a redeemer. And each time, each step that was taken by that donkey toward Jerusalem, I want you to realize it was a step for you and for me. It was a choice that he made each way, each time he got closer to Jerusalem, not just to that city, but into our lives. What I want you to see when it comes to this particular Palm Sunday and this passage is that there are few better demonstrations of what love actually looks like. That love always, always will cost you something and will force you to take risk and to be more vulnerable than you may want to be. When Jesus is marching into Jerusalem, he is saying, I will be less safe, less comfortable, more vulnerable. Why? Out of my love for you. There is no deep love without there also being discomfort and vulnerabilities. C.S. Lewis in his book, uh, The Four Loves, has this remarkable quote. He says, to love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it up carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. It's a real pick-me-up. <laughs> but I love that he doesn't mince words at all. You know, we've talked about this some before. It is a temptation that many of us have, and especially many of us who don't belong to a church. And that is to simply say, you know what, I'd love to follow Jesus. It's just, you know, the church. I just don't want to be in the church, you know, it's just full. We said this a couple weeks ago, hypocrites and just brokenness and all those things. But what I've begun to see even this week is the fact that a part of the reason it seems to me that it's very likely why people would long to follow Jesus but not be on part of the church is because it is much safer, it is much more comfortable, it is much less vulnerable. Because when you do so, you can follow this kind of Jesus that you have up there, and, and that Jesus, you know, is not going to let you down. Everything will be just fine, always full of hope and forgiveness and all those things. And you don't have to deal with the complexities of simply being with other people and the ways in which they cause us to struggle at times and the ways in which they don't live exactly as Jesus wished that they would live. And a few years ago when I preached on this passage, I talked about the fact that it's very easy for us to ridicule the people in Jerusalem who are shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, and, and then it seems many of them at least likely are saying, crucify him. It's very easy for us to mock them, but what I also realize is this, at least they were there. Because what we don't read about, what we don't see about, even from Mark, who likes to give a lot of extra details is he doesn't talk about the fact that there were plenty more who never even showed up. And they were much safer. They were much more comfortable. They didn't feel betrayed at all. They just got to sit back there in the safety of their houses or homes or wherever else it was that they were. But you see, following Jesus is not simply about staying safe. It is about following him literally into the heart's 
of one another. It is about following him in the very midst of pain and vulnerability. Because if you decide to stay away from that, you are right, you may protect yourself from being hurt or from your heart being broken, but you will also protect yourself from experiencing deep and meaningful love. I can assure you that there have been times without question when people in the body of Christ have disappointed me or have frustrated me or have hurt me. And it would be very easy for me to just focus on that and say, oh, we should just stay at home. This is no good. But I can also tell you that it pales in comparison to those moments when you begin to consider them, when I considered them in my own life, of when the body of Christ has been there in remarkable ways. I immediately began to think about when a Christian sister came over in the literal middle of the night to watch over our then one-year-old eldest child so that Megan and I could go to the hospital as we wrestled with the repercussions of a miscarriage that she had. Or a Christian brother many years ago who sat down with me and who had a really hard conversation and told me the truth about myself in ways I did not want to think about or see. It wasn't easy, and yet it changed the trajectory of my life. Or those few several Christian men in my life, older Christian men who have been in many ways the spiritual and father mentors to me. Or the many primarily Christian sisters who have, who have really fed into the life of my children and allowed them to understand that they are loved, that they are known, that their name is known, and that God cares about them and that they care about them. If you begin to just go through your mind person after person of those within the church following Jesus who, though imperfect, have walked with us and helped us to experience true, deep, meaningful love. See, this is what happens when we follow Jesus into Jerusalem. This week, we will march behind Jesus, and I hope that you will spend some time simply asking in what ways are you preparing to see the Lord? Perhaps it will be simply by you getting out of the normal part of your life, of taking away 30 minutes or so of your normal every day, doing something to disrupt your life. Or perhaps it's simply when you're going about your daily life and these tasks that you just, oh, that you despise, that feel again like simply trying to get all the manure out from in between your toes, maybe you begin to see how what you are doing is a part of the larger arc of the kingdom of God. Maybe it's simply by being more vulnerable or by ridding the clutter that keeps you from being able to experience Jesus more freely. Whatever it is, I hope and pray that we would this week march behind Jesus toward Jerusalem toward forgiveness and redemption and new life. And in so doing, might we see Jesus anew. May it be so. Amen? Amen. And let's pray. God, we know that you are here and that you are in our lives, and yet so often we miss you. And so we pray once again. The same prayer that we have prayed so many times over the last several months, that you would open our eyes to you. Those things, Lord, that may be distracting us, those things that may keep us, Lord, from being able to see you more clearly, we pray that you would remove them from our lives. And in so doing, we might see you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let me remind you again, sisters and brothers in Christ, that the invitation to this table is not a right that is conferred upon the worthy, but as a privilege given to the undeserving, that even those who doubt or whose trust may be wavering can come to this table in order to be assured of God's grace and love in Jesus Christ. I love the story to Emmaus. You know the story 
But I love how the reality is it was in this very everyday, ordinary thing of Jesus simply breaking bread that they were able to see who he was right there in their presence. And so my hope and my prayer on this day is that as we eat of this bread and we drink of this cup, that we might experience the presence of the living God. And let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks for your grace for us. Without it, we can do nothing in our own strength. God, we are in great need, and yet you give uh, yourself to us. Help us again to see you anew, to be present in our lives. God, we thank you for this meal, and we pray that you bless it to our bodies and to our very hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So the Lord Jesus, on the night before he died with his disciples, after giving thanks, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant sealed in my blood and shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink of it, you do this in remembrance of me. For every time that you eat of this bread, every time that you drink of this cup, you are proclaiming the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. Sisters and brothers in Christ, we invite you this morning to come forward and you can take a piece of bread. If you need something gluten-free, there are gluten-free parts inside of these trays here. And then also you can grab um, a, um, a cup of grape juice and you can head back to your table and then you can, to your table, to your chair, you can sit here if you want to, or go back to your chair and you can eat and drink there. If you're over here on this side, we invite you to come down this aisle and return in that way. If you're here in the center, please come in this direction. And if you're over on that side, you can come down this aisle and then return. If our servers would please come forward.
Let's pray. God, we do thank you for the ways in which you are broken for us. And we pray that in that brokenness, we might see our own brokenness and we might follow you into Jerusalem. It's in your name we pray. Amen and amen. Please stand. Sisters and brothers, this week I invite you to do one of these things. Doesn't matter what it is. Disrupt your life this week for 30 minutes perhaps every day. Just do something different that makes you aware of your life, that opens up your ears to what is going on around you. Or maybe think about those purchases. Before you click, ask what it's actually costing you. Is it also costing you space in which you can also be with the Lord? Or perhaps begin to see this week those small things that you are doing and the ways in which they connect to God? Or are there ways in which you are keeping yourself safe rather than walking behind Jesus in the ways in which he was vulnerable that you might then experience love in ever deeper ways? Whatever it is, I pray that as we go through this holy week, you might experience Jesus in ever deeper ways. And with that, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you this day and until Christ Jesus returns. Hallelujah. Amen. of Palm Sunday.